Hey guys, today I am going to be kicking off a new series of videos on this channel, a series of videos which will involve me taking a look at various different email services and assessing their pros and cons and their value and basically giving a bit of a brief review over each one. And today, of course, we're going to be taking a look at Fastmail. Now, Fastmail is the email service that I have been using this year and have been really quite happy with them. Now, that being said, I was on a plan that isn't listed on this little pricing page that you see before you here. I was on a light plan, which was about a dollar a month or ten dollars a year, and they recently decided to get rid of that plan. Now I still can can use that plan as as a, like a legacy option, but. The thing is with legacy options with just about any kind of service is that they're never as well supported as their flagship options. It's, you know, it's going to be about another five years of me using the same email service with limited support and then probably I'll have to be ushered in to one of the other plans eventually. That's how these things usually work. So that's kind of prompted me to just have a look at the other options and to see what options are available and what I get and what I don't get and so forth. I'm also going to be looking at it in the, uh, you know, sort of through the perspective of someone that's privacy conscious as well and someone that prefers open source software. And I'm going to be taking all those things into consideration. So uh, I'm also going to be taking into consideration price as well. Now, there are going to be various, this is going to be particularly subjective depending on, you know, sort of how much disposable income you've got, but also how often you use, you use email, whether it's for business or personal use, all these kind of factors are going to factor in into the price. So I'm going to be looking at it from my personal perspective, which is as a personal account that I do business on as well, or possibly, you know, like a dual account. So I might have one email for personal, one email for business, that kind of thing. Um, and possibly even maybe using the webmail interface as a, uh, as a way to manage all my emails together or possibly um, just to, to have like being able to manage a decent volume of emails uh, significantly reliably. Okay, so we're going to kick off with fast mail today. Um, and I, I started off on the pricing thing because that was the thing that prompted me to even start this series, to have a look at some of the other options available. Um, so £3 a month or $33 a month or $30 a year is our opening uh, price. And the standard plan, which is about $5 a month or $50 a year, and then they've got a professional plan, uh, 9 and 90 uh, it provides uh, pr personal support, which I have used, and they do have really good personal support. Uh, you you can just fire off an email um, and asking, you know, asking any question pretty much with your with your email uh, account and how it's working, uh, technical details and all that kind of stuff, and they get back to you quickly and they get back to you concisely and and knowledgeably. They have a really good support system, and I I kind of feel this is really what you're paying for. This is the crux of, of, of what you get when you start paying $3 a month for email. You start getting someone else on the other end of an email address that you can, you can go to in the event of problems. And that really does help in a lot of cases. No ads, always a benefit. Um, I know that a lot of people use ad blocking software now, so whether or not an email service has ads is a little bit of a moot point in a lot of cases. But the thing is, with ads, and this is the really important thing to bear in mind with ads, it's not that they're annoying, and it's not necessarily to a degree of whether or not they can track you, although that again is something significant of discussion, but the real problem with ads in email services um, that I think is particularly relevant is the how it incentivizes the relationship that you have with your email service provider. It goes back to that old maxim of if you're not the customer, you're the product. And that's the case with services like Gmail. And Gmail, Google Mail, is going to be the email ser uh, service to which I compare all others. Because Google uh, Mail and Gmail, I'll just call it Gmail, uh, is a really quite a good um, email service provider. It's ad supported and it's free. So that's kind of like a gold standard. It's a very difficult standard to beat. Uh, and the big thing that goes against Gmail is that you don't really have serious privacy. Um, from, well, yeah, that, that, again, that's a different question because when we're talking about security and privacy, we're also talking about who do we want, you know, security or privacy from. Like, for example, if you live in a country where you, you you are happy with the government, you trust the government not to go snooping through your emails and you've got a various amount of civil liberties, then the biggest people you're probably worried about might be um, 
hackers or it might be you know like uh, con artists or it might be foreign governments or you never know so whoever you're trying to protect your email from changes from use case to use case that's kind of the point that i'm trying to to make out so google uh, mail gmail is really quite secure when it comes to protect you know like i don't remember there being any massively major hacks in in recent uh in recent memory whereas like most other services have had some kind of leakage now you know we can deal with this we can use password managers we can use open source password managers and all that kind of stuff and that helps but for the most part i think gmail is really quite a good service when it comes to the practical elements of things now bringing it back to ads the problem with gmail and the fact that it's ad supported means that you as a customer are not actually a customer you're a product and what that means is that it, there are little in, incentive um sort of incentives to put you on the back burner as a as a member of this transaction as it were um the first is that it makes it worth their while for it, for your their email service to actually be time consuming to use to not be efficient because the longer you spend in your email interface the longer you spend looking at ads which disincentivizes google to have a user interface that lets you get the job done quickly but one that lets you look at adverts the longest without you really knowing about it so these you know there, there are numerous reasons why you want to be careful about having ads in your workflow uh, is basically what I'm uh, what I'm trying to raise there is that it 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 takes you out of being a customer, which means that you don't have like co consumer rights as well. And this goes back to what I was saying in a previous video about um, consideration. Now, consideration is a legal term, but it's it it means that you're entitled to. It basically means that if you're paying money for something, you're entitled to consumer rights, whereas if you're getting something for free, you're not entitled to those kind of rights. I believe that I'm not a legal expert, but that's. Um, that's the essence of what I'm trying to get to is that, that your email service pr uh, provider are going to be accountable to you if you're a customer, whereas Google, they're accountable to their advertisers. So uh, certainly before you anyway. Now, I do have to say, looking at this pricing chart, um, 30, 50 and 90, particularly even 30, it's a little much to pay for a service that is offered for free just across the other side. And you're paying for a for a, a, a sort of a degree of privacy getting rid of the ads um the uh, the full mobile sync support now this is an interesting one as well because they have mobile uh, they have mail contacts and calendars that are included into this batch now the web interface for fast mail is brilliant i'm going to get onto that in a second and the application for the mobile phone um the smartphone is actually really quite good as well uh it's just really just a mobile interface for what you get on the web that being said though and i'm saying that being said quite a lot this because uh, there are a lot there are a lot of back and forth in in when it comes to these kind of services but um but the issue with um the mobile application is that you can't you can use other services like um, an email client to check your email, but there are you can't use like another service to to sync your calendar or to um, to access your your dates or your contacts or anything like that. So, if you don't like using their sort of proprietary uh, mobile application, which you know in fairness is pretty good, then you're you know then you're kind of stuck on your own in that case. Um, but then if you're happy to use your, your email client, then then go ahead. You can't sync contact addresses, but f I don't know. In my personal workflow, that's not the biggest of issues because I can just export my contact addresses and then move them over to the phone. They don't have to be synced in real time. The vast majority of what I use my email for is, to repl is replying to emails sent to me, which you don't need a, a contact list for anyway. But again, like I say, you've got to weigh up your own use cases and what might be my conclusion might not necessarily be the same for yours. And I'm going to try and be as open, uh, open ended about this as possible and as inclusive. So um, they have some pretty good documentation here. And for the most part, they're smooth running. Like I, I don't think I've had any serious problems. Now, um, another thing that you can do, in fact, uh, now that we've pretty much had a look at this uh, page, we can get rid of that. We can move over to the actual interface itself here. Now, as you can see here, I've got a free trial account because obviously I'm not going to be sifting through my actual email on uh, on a public video. And this is the the welcome to fast mail email that they give you. And this is basically how an email is presented. You've got these nice labeled buttons at the top and you've got your folders at the side. You can just click here and then you can masterly change, create a folder. And then it automatically throws you into the settings as well. 
So this is what your mail looks like. Your address book. Uh, we can add a new contact. Mr. A. B. Um, I th think. Seventeen years old, February the first, nineteen ninety-nine. Believe it or not, not my actual birthday. Um, so yeah, that is the. Um, let's go back into address book. So that is yeah, that is a a card, and then you can just go into mail, compose. Oh yeah, I didn't actually put an email address in. But yeah, that is the uh, that is the address book. And edit the contact here so we can put in an email address I bet hello at hello.com gets like a horrendously large amount of email okay and then you can save it and then you can pop back in and then yeah you can have signatures as well of course as you can with it. so it basically offers you the same functionality as um, Gmail, you can have, I think it's about five different identities once you have a full, fully paid up account. Um, it doesn't say off here on the bat, but uh, it does. It, like, it offers you a number of um, uh, aliases. So if you want to use this Fastmail account for work and personal, uh, you've got it. Now, you can also check other POP... Um, mail accounts. So if you're wondering why I f feel that I can actually hop from mail service to mail service to mail service and not really suffer too much of a, an issue with it, it's because I have my own domain and that domain then forwards to whatever email account I want to use. So um, so it, it allows people to keep up with me while at the same time still being able to try out primary email clients first hand. So basically, what I can do with something like Fastmail is using this uh, Send Mail and Fetch Mail from uh, tab, I can set up uh, existing email accounts that I have, perhaps um, that belong to a domain that I own, uh, and then I can actually check mail from that domain and send mail from that domain here, effectively making Fastmail a web face slash you know, sort of Android application front end uh, for my current email setup, uh, which you know, is, is something that you can do too with uh, with this here. So if you're really looking for just a really good email client that you can access online, but you already have like an email address that you'd rather use, you have the option to uh, to do that here. You have rules which allow you to just allow incoming mail to get redirected into folders of your choosing. It's got a pretty good spam filter. I think it uses heuristics, but um, it's it gives you a score and you can... Uh, you can set how aggressive you want your spam filter to be. I found the standard settings to be more than adequate. You've got vacation responses, address groups, which are useful. Uh, they're very good if you have like regular conversations with groups of people, you can just bring it up. But these are all things that Google and Gmail already provide. Uh, you can also um, use your own domain using the standard price plan. Uh, which I assume means that you're using their service to send and receive email from rather than your own if you're using the identities and fetch. So if you have like an email account from like Gandhi or um, GoDaddy, I think they also offer an email service, uh, you can then use those email services from your uh, domain registrar and then access them here. But you can also use but also using the service for your domain registrar. Whereas if you want to use everything Fastmail but with your own domain, then you might have to start paying $50 a year, which, again, it feels an awful lot if all, you know, for, for, for personal email. Now, for business email, possibly, but for personal email, that is a fair amount. And also, you know, if you have to compare it next to Google, is there really anything Fastmail can do apart from the support, apart from being able to have someone else on the other side of the email uh, apart from not having adverts and having an interface designed to be you know smooth and late you know and and and, and quite pleasant this is a very pleasant user interface no customizability so you've even got some customizability in, in things like google as well um, but you can access if you want customizability use your imap client use a mail client 
Um, also, another thing that I should point out, the conversation view. So if you if you like um, your inbox to have a nice conversational view, as I do, uh, that you get in Gmail, this also provides that, and it provides it really well. I know that it's a bit hit and miss on other services. For the life of me, I don't know why. But there you go. Um, I think I've said about everything there is to say about Fastmail. Uh, it's really not that... Um, different from Gmail other than that it's just not Google um, and I think the real thing that you have to look at and it's very competent like I've not had any technical problems with it whatsoever it is fast it is perfectly fast it's it's pretty much real time from the test that I've done it's it's boom 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 so you've got you've certainly got a lot of competency with that email uh, uh, with fast mail but when you stack it up against Gmail it doesn't really offer that much um, so you have to then start looking at the philosophy of the situation. Do you want to? Do you specifically not want to have a Gmail account? Do you think the Google, you know? Do you do you not want too many of your services in one place because it gives Google too much control over you or or too much dictation over your workflow? Or maybe you don't like the Google's privacy policy. Maybe you don't like the fact that they basically hand over their email to any law enforcement person that seems to to come asking for it. And if you've got an issue with that, then Fastmail could certainly be an option there. They claim not to track. Their privacy policy does say explicitly that if they have um, a search warrant, they will open up their servers. Um, and they may have to open up their servers as per certain treaties. But for the most part, if there isn't an actual official proper law enforcement procedure, they're not going to open up their servers to let them look through your email. So they've got a, certainly a privacy policy, which I respect. Now, it's not ironclad. It's not we will protect your email at all costs. It's we will follow the law, but we will not do anything less than that. They'll only do what is legally required of them, which is really all you can ask. If you want something any more, you can only ever ask the people follow the law and even then you know like there's a thing called the knock 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 test which is what what will a company do if the fbi show up to their door right this all well and good saying that you'll protect email at all costs but when you've you know when you've got feds breathing down your neck and all the all the money they've got and all the resources they've got and all the time they've got they can palm jobs off to interns and all that kind of stuff you know are you really able to fight that legal battle some companies have fought it and lost but then can they fight the next one and the next one and the next one See, I'm going to let you make up your own mind when it comes to what your privacy needs and requirements actually are. They differ from person to person, use case to use case, and country to country as well. But Gmail do offer a really good set of services that are comparable to Fastmail. If you're looking for uh, something that's very close to Gmail, but not run by Google, that has an established privacy policy and a good track record of providing a good service, Fastmail is where it's at. If you can stomach the price, I think that it's a really, you know, quite a good service. Um, the the value to me at least is is what you get out of it so if you only send a handful of emails a year this probably isn't even worth the three pound a month basic package however if you use email professionally day in day out and you want someone that you can count on you want support that's there uh that you want speed you know and, and efficiency and uh competence and this is this is a really good place to go so that's my review it's a little long it's a little rambly but again with email it's more than just the the pragmatic uh, user interface issues there are of course oh yeah and it saves you drafts uh, uh, there are uh, there are issues around privacy there are issues around what kind of software they're using on their servers and all that kind of stuff um, if open source is something that's particularly important to you and if you want to use a service which has a commitment to open source you will not find that at Fastmail so that is something you should be aware of but then when it comes to federated systems like email where what you're really doing is you're trusting the company that you're that's providing you the service with the privacy and the security of your email you do need to find a company that you trust and this is where trust comes in like good security is zero knowledge good security you shouldn't have to trust but with email you kind of do because even if they say that they use open source software and all that kind of stuff um, you never really 100% know what's being deployed there end and what they're doing. So there is always a degree of taking them for their word at it. Of course, when it comes to um, being a customer, it does mean that 
there sort of there are laws around false advertising. They do have to tell. They do have to provide what they tell you to provide. But you know, again, it comes down to resources. Are you really going to be in a position where you're able to check that? You know, and so forth. So, you, like you say, there's a lot of questions that need to be asked when it comes to picking the right email provider for you. And if those are the kind of questions that you just don't want, you know, that bore the hell out of you, then you know maybe Gmail is your best option. Like it is good. It's just not very private. And I think if you can square that with the privacy policy. If you only use Gmail, perhaps for the most professional uh, of professional correspondence, maybe you've got less of an issue there with the privacy. I'm certainly not saying, you know, um, if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear. That, to me, is one of the biggest lies of the entire privacy debate. But sometimes it's not worth spending money on something that you don't need, I guess, is another question. Um, but again, it's up to you and it's up to your personal compass I guess um, to work out what companies you want to support what services you need and um, and how you how you use them so that's about it for me today thank you very much for watching and listening there is a new podcast up um, which I will link to down in the description below there should be another one up reasonably soon as well uh, apologies for the delay in videos there's just been a lot of um, shuffling around in the personal world but um, things are starting to settle down and you should start seeing um, uh, an increase in, in the video output so that's about it from me today thank you very much for watching and until next time I've been Chris Ware and you've been awesome take care now <laughs>